Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Wes Faulkner of Explorers Percussion. Wes, welcome to the show. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Sure, my pleasure. So um, today we're talking about Zico Strums, which is, I would say, a well-known brand in the like drum nerd community, but maybe to like people who aren't as interested in this stuff, they may have never heard of Zico Strums, but it's definitely something that's affected through the acrylic drums, really the uh, made a huge impact on drumming. You know, back during the time, I think the very first time I got to see one of his drum sets was probably like around, it's probably close to around 72 when they did the newer lugs and stuff on them and everything. And uh, they were very futuristic looking because, you know, we're just now getting into more of the more plastic, you know, acrylic world. And uh, we saw them, it looked, you know, it was very futuristic, you know, um, yeah. And seeing them and everything it was like a very new uh type of material you see something made out of you can see through it and that was like wow you can see through these you know these drums and everything so it was really cool to see them yeah. and uh i remember the, mo- the most popular set i always saw was that they called it the 400 drum set which was like 214 hmm. rack toms an 18 inch floor tom and then the wow. uh the deep long bass drum and that was like 750 dollars and brand Jeez. new that's expensive for for obviously for back then. I mean, and those are huge sizes. Um, but all right. So as you kind of alluded to, these are very early, some would say the first acrylic drums, but why don't we, um, rewind a little bit and let's talk about Bill Zikos, the inventor founder of the company who this, this was in Kansas city. You're in Kansas city, Missouri. So this was kind of in your uh, the suburbs around you, correct? Right. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said before, um, we talked in the past that, you know, there's a we're kind of a dual city. You know, Kansas City, Missouri is the main metropolis, but there's also Kansas City, Kansas. So all the big suburbs around on the Kansas side are really kind of suburbs of still Kansas City, Missouri. And sure. that's where he kind of uh, settled in at in the early to the mid 60s, where he did a lot of teaching. But, uh, couple of big school school districts there like Shawnee Mission School District and he worked with a lot of the uh, school bands and he composed music that they played and Bill Zico's also uh, worked with like little percussion ensembles back mm. then within the schools he had lots of students and they even did like sometimes halftime shows at the Kansas City Chiefs games back in the 60s oh, wow. and everything so uh, mm. he kind of had a little thing invented kind of like uh, like four or five drum sets together they did like, you know, uh, kind of a quartet drum sets. And uh, I think it was later on, went to a UMKC, UMKC conservatory that was, uh, they used it over there, over there a lot too. And uh, people would like take breaks and solo away. You'd kind of get them a little motif going and everything. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, Bill though, I was, a, I think a, mostly a big band drummer. He played in the same uh, hitting band and a couple other bands as well. And before he came back to Kansas City and, you know, I think he grew up in uh, Fulton, Missouri, which is uh, not too far away from here. That's great. So obviously his background, like you said, as a performer, um, I'm sure he was like tinkering around with drums. But he so you said he was building some kits for his students, right? Was that those were not acrylic, though, at that point, right? Uh, yeah, not that I know of. I know that he had like a little small like, where he taught drum lessons at. Like half the shop was kind of mostly drums, and and half the shop was uh, guitars and other musical instruments. Uh, and uh, he was really into sonar drums a lot. Mm. And uh, sonar was really he really loved sonar drums. He played. That's what he was playing for. He you know of course came out with his own drums. But uh, I did ask him, "What did you first think of you know?" the clear drums and everything, you know, the clear drums would be cool. And he said that he was like late fifties what he told me. Hmm. But one of the first things I heard he started doing was he was ordering, when he had this little shop, he was ordering drum heads from uh, Bob Beals who ran, you know, Evans drum heads, which is out in Dodge city at that time, uh, Dodge city, Kansas. And he was uh, special ordering drums. He was actually, I think taking the coating off the, the, the coated drum heads, which, which would then be clear because they're just, you know, sprayed uh, the coating yeah. was sprayed on the, the clear heads and he was asking them to especially you know just send the heads without the coating on there so he's one of the first guys that actually kind of kind of innovated clear drum heads to a certain extent oh. too 
And later on, that was a big influence on the hydraulic head, the two ply head with the real oil in the middle, not the, a lot of people kind of thought, you know, pinstripes and emperors sure. were oil too. So he had a big influence on that as well, which I think, which I think made the clear heads. Some think might have gave him the idea at the time to go into clear drums, but he, like I said, he told me that he thought of clear drums back in the late, late fifties and everything. Mm. So. You know, and, and I mentioned it, I did an episode about just kind of broad acrylic drums, which we didn't go deep into um, Zikos or anything much on that. But I remember mentioning that, like, there's also the like whole thing where like plastic became more readily available. And uh, you think of like, I think of like skateboard wheels where they turned into like, you know, they went from being hard to like this more like, uh, uh, like softer rubber and it was all around that time of like the late fifties, early sixties. So I guess it's, it's the materials became more accessible and, um, he saw it as an opportunity, which is pretty innovative. It's very true. Yeah. I think I can remember as a kid, like around, you didn't really start, started seeing even plastic in cars, like around 68, there might've been very little in it before that. Cause it was all metal, you know? And, uh, yeah. so plastic. I remember my dad got a new car in 1968 and he started sending the plastic. Then by like, you know, a couple years later, 70 or early 70s and everything, uh, you saw a lot more plastic in the cars and, and taken away from the, the metal and everything. Yeah. So, so I always say, like I said, the, the, it's why the acrylic drums were looked very futuristic back then. And of course, I think Ludwig came out with their clear, the Vislites like around 73 was in the catalog, but they weren't, I don't think there were very many in the, in the, in the stores yet. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. yeah, his drums were very, very, very futuristic. I think the first set he made, by the way, did have sonar hardware on it. Had okay. sonar lugs and everything. That's and, neat. Uh, I know sonar guys would like to hear that. Uh, it's always neat to piece together little bits of of history like that. But all right, so do you know more details, though? Like that first time he was in his shop. I mean, I... I mean, maybe he's he's obviously more like uh, inventive than me, but it's not like you can just go out and like, you know, l- heat some plastic over clear plastic over a candle and melt it. <laughs> you know, like how did that process go? Yeah, I'm not for sure exactly how they first they made that first kit. Uh, if they were, I think they were doing it. It was pretty crudely done before they got the. They had a big oven, which was um, like a big pizza oven. I think it was like mm-hmm. around eight feet wide and four feet deep. And, uh, but I think that what they did, what they did at first, it was, it was very crude the way they did it. It didn't have like a regular, you know, obviously a full size oven or, or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do know that they, they, they did make their shells. We, he made it, he had like a, like these molds. He, when he heated up the, the acrylic, they went around the molds. So it was kind of from the outside around the mold. Mm-hmm. And I do know that Ludwig made theirs from the inside of the mold but there's an inside. So, um, interesting. But, uh, but he did have in mind when he did his shells were, they were a quarter inch thick. They were thicker than anybody else's in, even in the future. I think the Ludwig drums were like around three sixteenths hmm. thick. So he, and he advertised that too. And supposedly he did get a patent like around 1970. So, oh, and that nice. was always advertised in his little pamphlets, you know, they, they're, they're, they're patent because they're so unique and everything. But, was uh, that patent on like clear acrylic drums? I mean, how did that work with like uh, Fibes, uh, Ludwig, um, you know, various companies doing? Because other, uh, I mean, most companies had uh, acrylic drums not too far after that. Was that a big problem for him? I think it was at first. And I think they did call Ludwig or had, you know, it's in a, 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 a attorney sent a letter to them and everything. They just pretty much laughed and everything they, they said you know we don't we don't we don't care you know we're just going to keep on doing what we're doing hmm. and i think they did make they made a few sets with ludwig hardware too not just only a few of them um wow. it's because the first set was um had the sonar hardware on it sonar lugs i think it had a camco these dick camco double tom holders a lot yep and um one reason why too because camco was then out in chinook kansas which was not that far away the Kansas side, um, mm. and they were pretty good holders back then for that that time. Um, so the first set was made for Ron Bush, you know, the Iron Butterfly drummer. Oh wow! That was the very first, the very first drum set. And then uh, 
second set was made for Keith Moon, and he used Slingland hardware on that, Slingland lugs. And then the third set was a demo kit that was uh, had Slingland lugs as well that was supposed to kind of go with the Bill Ward of Black Sabbath, but he never did supposedly buy it. But I think I did see him playing a clear set of, you know, Zico's there around the mid-70s. I think it was like the, the, the volume four album. Man. Um, Again, inside that album, he's playing a clear set of Zico's drums. But uh, those are like, I mean, I think there's a lot of independent drum builders today who um, I know it was different in the 60s and 70s. But like, man, I mean, your first kind of I don't want to use the term endorsers, but you know what I mean? Like your first guys are, are using them are, let's say, Sabbath and the Who. And we'll throw Iron Butterfly in there because they're, they're maybe not the biggest band in the world, but Inigata De Vida is obviously a part of like rock history. Sure. Those are like the biggest drummers you could ever get in the world playing <laughs> your drums. Very <laughs> true. <laughs> Very true. And it's like, you know, like 69 was the, was the Ron Bushy um, okay. set. That was a that big Inigata De Vida drum solo. That solo there was... It had a lot of influence on people. You know, that was a, that was a solo. You know, I mean, Whoa. for for rock drummers, you know, back in the the, the four and the one, you know, uh, four, I mean, the four and the four bass drum, you know, thing going on and everything. Yeah. Um, but um, so in '72, then he had they got their own lug casing, so their own, the, you know, design and everything. But backing up a little bit, though, one little thing a lot of people don't know about uh, Zico's is that. He had a little bit of, of a he him and this the guy that had the other side the the music store, uh, his name was Mike Wagner. He had a they had a, they they formed a, a production company called the MWZ Production Company. They brought some of these bands in to to Kansas City, and when they came in there to the to the venue to play, which is usually this this place called Memorial Hall over in uh, on the Kansas City, Kansas side, he would bring a clear kit down there and show them the drums and everything. Mm-hmm. That's how he kind of, you know, he kind of, I guess you could say, you know, homegrown direct advertising there. Yeah. And uh, and a lot of times when they did this, they had these stamps they made where they would stamp their names on the drum heads, whatever drummer that was, and they brought the drums down there. So this Bill Ward drum set is still around Kansas City. Um, Oh, cool. And you can see, I've seen seen it before, and it's just a nice little stamp on the, there's nothing fancy, just a little of his name, you know, Bill Ward on the the clear... uh, clear heads and everything uh, so it's kind of cool that's wow. neat that's really kind of nice homegrown you know plan in fact the first time it might have been technically the second but i think it was the first time that when zeppelin came led zeppelin came to kansas city uh they rented they actually played as uh, bonham played as a, a zico's kit whoa that is yeah deep on so many levels because obviously like zeppelin you think ludwig but on top of that you think the amber vista lights so um yes nuts that's awesome actually they did two shows um and i think the second show not to get off record here but uh off the beat here but he supposedly got he got really sick and the like third second or third song he just like threw up all over his drums <laughs> and one of bill zico's students finished the show with zeppelin yes oh my <laughs> yeah. god i don't know i can't really i don't know the kid's name that did it but yeah in fact he was using it was actually his drum set i think he was like this is like for this is before john john bonham was a you know big legend and everything but he's like really excited it's, you know rock star was playing his drums and everything and all of a sudden all of a sudden then john got sick and threw up all over the drums and everything <laughs> so man you, you think of those like the stories of keith moon passing out from like horse tranquilizers it's like um i wonder if john bonham was like he had food poisoning or if he was like completely partied out or something, you know? Yeah. I, I think it was in between shows. I think he was just, he was just drinking a lot. Someone said it was his birthday. He was celebrating, oh. but I, I think I looked at the date before. I don't think it was his birthday. I don't think I, that had any continuity there between his birth date and the day that they were uh, in town yeah. that night. But uh, I will say one thing too: Bill Zico's wife, her name was Barbara Zico. She was quite instrumental in a lot of the booking, all these bands and, and stuff too. And, and, uh, and also working within the Zico's company and everything. So it was kind mm. of a. That's awesome. Can we, um, I just want to clarify our dates here a little bit. So what would you say was the, like, when was the founding of Zico's drum company, like in the history of the company, if someone goes, Oh, I love Zico's. It started in like Ludwig 1909. You know, what was Zico's starting date? 
I'd say like 1969, probably when oh, they that, made that first drum okay. set for, but, but it, it became Zico's corporation though. in like 1972. Wow. So you had all these sets, you know, they had ones with sonar, you know, that sonar lugs on it. Uh, then you had the, you know, the ones with, with, uh, the few, the very few that had, you know, slingerland lugs on them, but they also made some sets that had, uh, the, the uh, Camco lugs on it too. They, I think there's like around tw- 20 kits were made with, with, with Camco hardware on them. Those are very, very early kits. Again, it was like 69 to 71 or so, you know, when all those, the uh, mixture of these different sets, different hardware, you know, was made. But I know there were the 20 kits that were made with, uh, made with that and them. And I think, like I said, a few sets I think were made with Ludwig uh, lugs. And Ludwig said, no, we're not going to, you know, when they get ready to come out to clear drums, they cut them off. And then, of course, they had their disagreements with, with the, the patent and all that stuff as well. But, um, yeah. So 72, the corporate, it became a cor- corporation. I, and from my understanding is that one of those eco students father helped and he made an investment into the company. So he was like, you know, say stockholder or, uh, the, yeah. one of the big investors. And that was sure. kind of one of the maybe errors that maybe Bill might've made there. Cause he let him have 51% of the company. Oh boy. So, uh, and down the road, um, there was some, uh, some, some issues with, you know, I guess some conflicts with, with money, you know, they were like, they thought there was, he was, he didn't like whether the money was, was being, uh, used or, or some other type of conflict. And one day those equals came to, came to work and they, they pretty much told him they didn't need him anymore. You know? Oh man. It's kind of like the George Way thing where like he goes home for lunch and then they just send him a message. Uh, what is it? John Rashawn. They're like, don't come back from lunch. We don't need you here. Very you similar go. to that. Yeah, it's very similar. And I think it next, that's when it became Zico's corporation. And uh, I was told by one the, 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 the good friend that works there uh, named Dave Dyke. He's really a very knowledgeable guy that, that works there. He's kind of pretty much a very important person that played a, a big, important part in the, in the company. He said that they, I think they bought like 50,000, um, like the lugs, the tension rods and the little claw hook, like they mm-hmm. bought 50,000 pieces all at the same time, you know? So there's a big, it's a big plus, you know, uh, as far, uh, as far as going forward you know, and becoming a, you know, regular drum company. And I think they were probably, I would say like around 1974, you know, 75 was probably when they were at their peak, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I, do, I did hear too that the Bill Zico is like late seventy one, very early seventy two is when he left the company. But then he could, he was asked to come back though too once it became the corporation. He came back and later later on in seventy two, but then then he left again. Huh. So yeah, it's it's also similar to North Drums. Um, doing that story with Roger North, it was like a the founder leaving and then coming back and then not having you know like they need him and and all that stuff. Um, now. On the Camco stuff, so this is I have I have two huge regrets uh, drum wise in my life, and one was recently where I was selling. So long story short, I was selling a camera that I had that I used for work, like you know doing video stuff, and selling it for like seven hundred bucks, expecting to get six hundred. Right at the time, and I'm I'm a big believer in if you sell like gear or a camera, then that money shouldn't go back into like, don't pay your mortgage or whatever with that money. Take that money and like buy more drums or buy more. I I was going to buy a computer or like, or put money towards a computer. Then on Facebook marketplace, a Zikos set pops up that had Camco hardware that I believe he said was like 69 or 70. Say that was really early. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it it was, and I don't think I have, I, I should have like screenshotted a picture of it or something um, just to save, which as I'm talking, I'll kind of look, but I kept being, it was like $650 for, I think it was the Camco hardware. It was, there was no snare. I'm assuming they didn't usually come with snares, but it was two toms and a floor tom and a 22 inch bass drum, I think. Um, and I was like, I I probably could have just like, bought the drums and then taken the money that I sold from the camera and kind of replenished that in like a savings account. But I didn't. And I was like, do you still have it? I'm still waiting to sell this camera. 
Uh, the guy sold them. And like three days later, I ended up selling the camera for the exact amount of money that I needed to buy this Zico drum set. Um, so I will probably <laughs> regret that for the rest of my life. Um, That's very but, rare for sure. Very rare. You know? Yeah. And I think they were in like uh, somewhere kind of middle of Ohio or maybe in Indiana. Um, and if anyone's curious, the second one was a set of fives. The second giant mistake I've ever made was I missed getting this really cool set of fives for like no joke, like $75 for the full set. Clearly Whoa. a person who didn't know the value of what they had. And uh, he said, you just missed it. And then he also texted me and said, I've gotten like 90 messages about this. So those are my two. And, and you know, you think about it every once in a while. You're like, man, that Zico's kid. <laughs> we might get the chance again. We might get the chance again. Yeah, yeah it guys. might come back up again. What What are those? Uh, we'll get back on like the history stuff. But what do they typically go for? Like that set. I mean, obviously, I just said, I think there was some scratches and, you know, it wasn't in perfect shape. It had the original bass drum head with the Zico's. But like. What? do they typically run for nowadays if you're trying to get your hands you know, on old Zikos? I think it's all over the place. I mean, again, it depends on what the person, you know, if they know what they've, they've got, you know, a lot of people these days, they look on the internet, they'll see someone's asking what they're, they're asking for a drum set. They'll, that's a, that's the price they'll think is what things are going for. Yeah. But that's really why people are asking for something. So it's not really what's, but what it's, it's not sold. It's probably still for sale. So it might be on the really low end side, might be on the very really high end side. Uh, but I would say the average Zico set now is probably, you know, and it's been in really, really clean condition, maybe like eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars. And you might even find okay. some sets for around five or six hundred. You know, the thing about clear drums is that they can, um, it, they're they're they, they get scratched up pretty easy. You know, it's almost sure. like uh, satin flame type finished drums. It shows a lot of scratches very easy, or chrome drums. They look great when they're that they've been taken care of and they're clean and everything. But if you don't, you know, if you're, if you're doing gigs and everything, you're tearing down, setting them up, tearing down, setting them up, then, you know, there's going to be some, probably some marks on them. And you get yellowing factors and stuff like that. Um, Zico's drums yeah. didn't have too much that, but there is some, there's a few plating issues once in a while. You might see like the, where the chrome might be coming off, you know, on the, mainly on the hoops or mm. there might be some small little cracks. Um, like a lot of people back in the seventies took their front, heads off the bass drum they took their heads off the, the bottom of the toms and everything but for clear drums it was usually better she had a lot of tension at the very top of the head uh, to have both heads on top and bottom mm -hmm. because uh, especially we had, you have a seam there it puts me at the tension pulling from the very top side it wants to split open the seam and everything and they happened a lot with on bass drums even with uh ludwig i know where we get the tom toms on the bass drum and they, they don't get the bass drum up high enough and the front get the front head off a lot of times yeah. the bass drum would split open or something, you know, so. Well, it's like, it's like a guitar where if you have a guitar with like the strings off of it for a long time, it's like, that's really not good for the neck. Um, that's true. I, I never thought about that. that that's it's probably very true too. Yeah. It starts going their direction kind of maybe, or if too yeah. much tension or too much tension could probably do the Zach can maybe, you know, bow it in a little bit, I guess too. But um, yeah. I mean, there's, okay. there. I think some drums, it just depends on how they're, they're taken care of, you know, uh, they're in cases for a long time and not taken out for gigs a lot. They're going to be probably very, you know, clean. They're stored in the right places, but I said the average price selling them again, back it's probably like, you know, you know, X at 800 to thousand, they're, you know, pretty clean. So they're not a lot. Yeah. Uh, not, not crazy money. I mean, um, one thing about the sale of all these drums and everything too, like in the late seventies, I think. I think it was kind of clear drums, maybe because of Ludwig had come out with all different colors and everything. People just got, there was just so many of them out there for a while. I think it kind of hurt the, the price of them a little bit. So we mm -hmm. went into business in like around 1984. Uh, people were getting rid of like clear kits like crazy. And I think wood kits were really in style. Like, you know, Tom was coming out with their superstar uh, kits. And, and uh, of course, the Imperial Star was more, more covered kits, but. But they had, you know, Billy Cobb and Neil Perp was advertising all these wood drums and sound and stuff. So people were just went like from clear to wood, the totally, you know, opposite direction. Sure. And um, so we got, we took in a lot of clear kits back in, in the 80s. And they were, were they were probably, so that's probably when they bust up the price of those drums were kind of bottomed out, you could say. Hmm. But uh, yeah, kind of, kind of interesting. You've made me feel better, though, about not getting that kit 
for because I thought six twenty five. I was like, oh my god, this is the best deal in the world. But it sounds like that's honestly about right. Like he did his homework. Yeah, probably so. And then you know you got the the set with the Zico lugs on it. You're gonna get all those other features too that he kind of like advertised, which is a big deal. Which they were kind of futuristic in a way, as far as at the time, you know, compared to other drum companies. You know, he had the bigger tension screws. They were mm-hmm. thicker supposedly thicker and stronger and everything that of course that only his tension screws work on his drums there were no springs in the lugs or anything you had the little uh, plastic sleeves or gaskets behind the lugs you know to, to isolate them I mean, of course no springs and everything cuts down all the you know vibration sound of the, of the springs and everything the buzzing sounds you used to have a lot on, on the drums but the, in the studio and everything um but of course they came with two ply heads back then and they, mm-hmm. when they got them going in 72 and uh, the quick release hoops, which was cool, which was very similar to the Miazzi drums back then. The Miazzi out of Italy was a yeah. uh, the, the lug was very similar to the Miazzi lug. And, and can can you explain that quick release? Because I'm looking at the pictures online, and I think I I mean I it's if you see it, you kind of understand it. But how does that quick release system work? Well, basically, there's like a little uh, round roller pin that the tetramo went down into. And then the tension rod, you know, and like where the, right where the washer would be, it has that little claw hook, and that hooked into that little slot. There was like little cutout slots around the uh, counter hoop that it hooked into. So you just had to back off this, this tension rod just a couple of turns, and then you just pulled out away from the drum, and you could turn change the head a lot, a lot quicker. Yeah. It's cool. It's smart. I feel like I've seen that elsewhere and it's kind of uh escaping me but that that technology yeah tama brought it back in the late 80s um they had a snare drum that they brought it back uh hmm. i think i think it's around 87 or 88 that's when i remember right um they brought back kind of a glassstone drum too that was kind of in a different concept they were kind of looking at other people's drum drums and everything and sure. i think they, they they brought it back again though and it was Kind of popular in some of their drums in the 2000s too. They they they're the only company I remember that actually they did that. And uh, the roller pin, of course, would cut, could come out very easily too. You had to kind of line it up with the hole yeah. and everything. But um, yeah, and it's, you had the curved spurs, which is you know before Ludwig had even had theirs out, which was definitely an idea from the Camco style. Um, yeah, for sure. And all the lugs and and tension rods work for all the drums which made it really simple you didn't have to have different lengths hmm. or anything uh or different size lug casings you know for like the toms the bass drum or snare drum so they were they were all the same size of course I had to stagger them on the snare drums because they're too big which and there's not a lot of not as equal snare drums out there anyway so they use the all they use the same claw and hook design too on the bass drum rims too because they had to use those metal hoops so there's no wood hoops or anything so now, why were there less snare drums? I mean, because when I think about it, I think like typically companies like maybe they make more snare drums than drum sets because people it's easier to buy a snare than it is to buy a set for the most part. Why didn't they make more snares? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it's a good, very good question. I don't really know why. Uh, it could have. It, 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 that's another reason why you probably could have like marketed the drums with the snare drum, get the snare drum out there, and later on, you know, buy the drum set. You know, mm-hmm. kind of. Uh, motion on that too but he didn't do that usually we saw his drums in the in the music store he had the three toms and the bass drum uh and i know that i could say well maybe because they didn't have their own throw off made or you know, the other snare strainer but they usually use um uh, i saw probably more slingerland uh zoomatics on their snare drums and the other uh model hmm. use but that's a good question. I don't know why the snare drums weren't, there wasn't more emphasis on the, on the snare drums because a lot of their Tom Toms were 14 inch they, and the hoops and everything you know, they had to cut a hole for the snare wires and yeah, and put a snare bed in there and you get, you know, snare, but uh, that snare drum is born, you know, besides you know, getting the right throw yeah. off is picked, but also yeah, similar to, uh, also similar to North where you don't see many of the, the North snare drums, um, with these. And I, I I'm only, Kind of using them as parallels because they're sort of independent, smaller companies that got bought up and then that you know grew and were were more home homegrown, like you said. Right, North snare drums are probably even more rare than Zico snare drums. Those are super yeah. rare. Yeah, yeah. I think that you know the, the snare drums are one of the more complex drums to make too. 
in some ways getting it right sure. you know but but uh still though he could have done it very easily you know and the ones he had were, were pretty decent this episode is brought to you by dream symbols dream just sent me over five symbols to try out including the dark matter bliss paper thin crash in 17 18 and 19 inches and two dark matter bliss crash rides in 20 and 22 and these symbols are awesome they're dark they're gritty they're explosive and they're just super unique Beyond how they sound, though, they look like they were buried for a year, dug up, lit on fire, buried, lit on fire again, and then sold to you. They just look so cool, and I highly recommend them. Learn more at dreamsymbols.com and find them on social media at Dream Symbols. All right, now looking at the timeline here, so founded 69-ish, 72, they became a corporation, 74 to 75, you said was the peak. So that's when they're just like, you know, what was their... What was the shop like? Was this still being, was everything, I know we were outsourcing like um, lugs and hardware and stuff, and I guess you said it, but they started making that at some point. Um, what was the factory, uh, if you can call it a factory, you know what I mean? What what was that looking like? I think they had regular, you know, drill jigs and everything for their drums, you know, to, to uh, make things more precise and mm. take less time and be more accurate. And they had to, a lot, actually a lot of, People that worked there, a lot of their uh, employees were drummers. You know, I've talked to a lot of people over the years. Yeah, I used to work in the Zico's, you know, drum factory for a while. Yeah, you know, I've, I've heard that from a few people. And um, so it was really set up like a regular factory. I know that, I think back in the early 70s, like 72, they might have been like maybe making four or five kits a day. But I think around 70, like around 74, it was like around 10 kits a day or so, probably. Hmm which was like on the big scale, wasn't a lot for us. That's a very small, you know, boutique company compared to what someone yeah. like probably what Ludwig would make a day, you know? Yeah. But I did, they, I was also heard that, um, uh, talking to, to Dave Dyke, that, 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 that worked there, he told me that they, they were considering, they were talking to Jasper and they actually for a short time period were considering making some wood drums for a while. Oh. So, Makes sense. I mean, they actually why considered not? it. Yeah, they kind of considered it's kind of just to widen their you know scope on on drums in their market a little bit, but uh, it never did happen. Um, mm. Yeah. Now, um, like, I'm always interested in this. If you're making ten kits a day and the demand is pretty, you know, pretty high, um, how does distribution typically work for companies like that? Because like the ones I was looking at, that was in Trenton, Ohio. How does it spread around for distribution? Did they typically send some kits to major stores around the country, or how does that process work? Yeah, I think it's pretty much how it worked. It was uh, they didn't have any distributors, from what I understand. They had no distributors uh, in Europe or anywhere else, but you know, just their own home office here in Kansas City. Most everything was made in Kansas City area. Only a couple of things were made out of out of Kansas City. So a lot of people, I think uh, that brought them over like um i've heard of you know or is it great britain or holland or wherever i think it was just someone that was would actually call them up and just order some drums and bring the, mm-hmm. he brought them into or they would bring them into their their country by you know by you know handful of kits and that's how they got brought into them so it wasn't like it was a very very small scale thing it wasn't like a distributor you know ordering you know 30 kits or 50 mm-hmm. kits or something it wasn't like that. I don't think it, it was never distributed. It was mostly like it was mostly stores and everything. Um, so he told me, I, I kind of a funny story about Keith Moon. Uh, I, I told him he got his first kit. Uh, I guess when he paid, they, I guess he, I guess they had problems getting getting paid for the kit. I guess they were buying the kits back then. Instead so of getting endorsed like they do it now, they do now. And I guess they called Keith Moon a couple of times. And every time they called his house, his, his wife would say, "He's down in." He's not the pub. He's, he, you know, he's not the pub. You know, called her again. You know, a couple more days later, hey, well, he's down at the pub. You know? Yeah. So it was kind of hard to get hold. It's kind of, kind of a funny story. And that uh, is funny, but it's kind of a. Um, it's funny, but I'm sure Bill was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Need to get paid for this because I'm sure shipping. I mean, you're looking at like putting it oh, on a yeah. ship. I mean, shipping was very expensive over there. It was a very shipping ship that I mean, all his drums over there as well. It was very wow. very expensive. Jeez. Well, hopefully he ended up getting paid. I mean, and you know, it's funny too, cause like Keith Moon, Bill Ward, both 
English drummers. So that pretty, pretty cool. I wonder how many Zikos drums there are floating around, um, you know, the used market in Europe. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, but probably not very many. I don't think it would be that many, you know. Yeah. To tell you the truth, it's kind of like how many, you know, Heyman kits are over here, you know. Exactly. I, 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 at the Chicago show recently, a couple months ago, I saw one or two, which they're like oddities almost, you know, it's like, it's more like, uh, just, you just don't see them. Um, but they're, they're really cool. They're beautiful drums. Um, so, all right, 74, 75, you got a peak, but typically with a peak, that means you're going down after that. So what, what happened as the peak dropped off? I heard they went to like around... Like they're still making drums up to like around 1977 or so, and then okay. I think they were just like down to like just selling parts and stuff after that for the next few years, you know. Mm. So I, remember, I do remember seeing the Zico's Corporation in the phone book here locally, like like around 1980 or 81 or so. But I think they were just selling just selling off the rest of the parts and stuff. But but um, so yeah. that's kind of uh, you know. Then of course you know Bill started making drums again back in the you know the 90s and then they come back, but um that's kind of going going forward i guess the one thing you might want to we could maybe mention here in the history was the 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 supersonic drums and those uh artistry drums back then i guess you know bill zico's had a non-compete um agreement with uh uh the guy who owned uh you know had 51 percent, which was i think his name was fred mcgraw if we can draw up mm-hmm. saying names here or not but I guess Bill came out that artistry kit, which was, was, was called the egg drums. You know, they're kind of shaped like eggs. If you ever saw those, mm. or fiberglass drums. No, I haven't. I have to look it up. Yeah, and they're like eggs, and uh, there, there wasn't very many of them made. You know, I mean, like twenty or thirty kits. And so, in uh, reaction to that, they came out with that supersonic kit, which were the kits that had like uh, I think a thirteen to fifteen inch rag tom, eighteen inch floor tom. And then the other side was a smaller head, like 18 inch had a 14 inch smaller head, the 15 had a 12, and the 13 inch ragtom, which were big ragtoms, had a, had a 10 inch on the other side. So you could play both sides if you wanted to. The 22 yeah. inch bass drum had a 16 on the other side, which was reduced down. These were fiberglass as well. And that was a reaction to these artistry drums. You just made those, and they made, I guess, around 100, 150 kits of those, white, blue, and red, I think. And that was oh, kind of yeah. interesting. You see them out there. They're kind of rare too. If you type in Zico supersonic drum. Yeah, them. they're, they're very, um, they're just interesting looking. They, they almost like, I'm, I know they're different, but like they remind me almost of like the, um, like the PV drums or something. Yeah. Like they're just like, they're <clears> just, <throat> like they don't look anything like that, but they're just so outlandish looking. It's almost just like, um, Kind of like Jetsons. Kind of yeah, like. it's like a Jetsons thing. And exactly. I, I kind of just explained it, but like, so so you said you can flip it over and play both sides, but like- You could, yeah. Why why do they look like this? And, and everyone should just Google Zikos, Z-I-C-K-O-S, supersonic, and you'll see, but like, what is the benefit of, of this? I don't know how much science is really behind it. I think it, you know, because it's like in a way it would be, it make more sense to be the other way. The smaller head would be your main, you know, yes. uh, batter side and the bigger head on, on, on the bottom side for your resonant head. But that was just, you know, what they, they kind of yeah. thought of then, you know, a lot of people look, looked at those drums too and they called them the, it looked like kind of like an old washer. You know, yeah, like a Maytag yeah. so, washer. You know, I mean, to if someone's like driving and can't look it up, the to describe it, it's basically it kind of looks normal at the top, normal head, and then it goes down, and then I guess the fiberglass kind of bevels in, maybe right. an inch, and then there's a rim that's like, like inset, but it's not flush. It's kind of sticking out, like it's almost like it's sitting on top, but I'm sure it's connected and has like a an edge and all that stuff, but. It does look like an old washing machine. It's it's it super Jetsons ish, and it had all the regular uh, Zico lugs on it, and uh, Zico hoops, and you know the call, quick quick release, you know tension rods and stuff. So it was kind of cool. The artistry drums did not; they had their own uh, those egg shaped the egg drums as they call them. They did not, and those are really hard to find a picture of. We we've had a kit of those before, but I will say um, there's an Al Green drummer i don't remember his name but i think he was also bb king's drummer hmm. he's on a video 
and it's then the song's called love like and it's like la l dash o dash b dash e it's like 1975 and he's playing one of those artistry egg shape sets he actually does a little solo it wasn't like what the soul train but it's one of those tv shows back then. so it's kind of cool to see that yeah. now can you just real quick like so z just to clarify zikos made the artistry series correct or was that some that was zikos right yeah that was him of course so that set was really the the supersonic kit was still by the you know, zikos corporation without bill zikos oh you know, i so see that was, i see yeah and that's where the non-compete problem came in where he said you know uh you know hey bill you're you're basically kind of doing uh you're not supposed to be doing that Right. Um, so I tell you some reaction to it. He just like made all these other, you know, supersonic drums, drums and stuff. Okay. And as a reaction, instead of like, you know, taking the chord over or whatever. So I guess he wasn't really, you know, he was selling drums. It was, wasn't selling clear drums. So I don't know what the particular words, what the particulars were in the uh, agreement, but, yeah. uh, so it's kind of interesting. It is. What was the name he was operating under as by himself, not as Zico's Corporation, but what was he calling himself for the drums? You know, that's a good question. What Zico's what Zico's Corporation? I think it was just Zico's drums, you know, because just using his name. You know, he only had like a couple of one or one I think one store I know here was selling them. Might have been a couple of stores selling them because there wasn't very many of those drums, you know, sold at all. Yeah. So, I mean Everyone's got to be thinking it the parallel to like Ludwig and WFL with that um, with the but he couldn't, you know, WFL couldn't use the Ludwig name. So uh, they must have had a different. Um, right. Good point. Thing. And there was that lawsuit with him because in a very small print in that late 30s badge you know, had the you know, founder was, you know, William F. Ludwig. And then. Yeah. God. He got taken to court for, for having that on those badges and everything. So I don't think. Name. Yeah, I think there's very many of those, you know, were made. Like, a lot of people, there's a couple of them I use those for, like, in videos later on, you know, like, mm. in the 80s, like, on MTV. There was some band I heard that would they'd use those. But that only video I've ever seen is that Al Green drummer in 1975. And it's kind of, it's a strange-looking, strange-looking catch, especially for, he's strange and very strange now. He's, I'm sure it's super strange back then. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's that's nuts. And, and it almost seems like as the peak kind of dies down, you said, like, mid to late 70s like 77 78 then it gets to where you were also saying about how people were just getting rid of acrylic drums left and right getting into the 80s so it sort of seems natural like it just sort of ran its course yeah i think it's, it's kind of slowed down a lot i think when when ludwig came out with the tivoli drums the lights and he had all the different stripes and you had like you know yeah. like a, six or so different you know uh patterns to choose from they just you know they I mean, how much, and it was a crazy time, you know, it was very busy you know, in, the, in, the, in the mid seventies for those, uh, for this light drums and everything. But I think they just kind of exhausted it, you know, to the, to the peak. And by the early eighties, you know, it was, it was kind of, people were kind of ready to you know, do something else. I mean, the business is, there's always a trend side to the music business, you know, and, and where the, the, the depth of your shells or the depth of your bass drum, the size of the bass drums, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it it's very trendy certain colors you know where it's solid colors to to burst or to fades sparkles i mean sparkles yeah. you know and stuff something you know, like when sparkles can even like satin flames sparkles when we started bringing males back you know like probably in the last 20 years and you yeah. get a lot of older people or older drummers you know to come in the store our store they'll see those like what's the big deal man we've already done this <laughs> you know but <laughs> yeah. again you get new customers you know it's kind of like bringing I always like like bringing the bell bottoms back in the fa fashion industry, yeah. Every ten years or something like it's new people, new new generation has seen it. So, yeah, that's kind of what happened with clear drums. I think you know in the late nineties, you know, in early two thousands, and that you know when Bill kind of brought him back, and uh, when he started back up again, and um, and it was still kind of early, you know. And fives came back, you know. Uh, with when uh, Tommy Dan Austin, you know, bought mm -hmm. Five's name and everything, but still wasn't really coming back. And then, you know, of course, Pearl's making clear drums. You know, Tom brought the clear drums back, and you know, D. Debbie's making that too. And yeah. so, and they're still, you know, they can buy a nice new set for, you know, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars. You know, exactly, so. exactly. I always, I always kind of 
think about it where I'm like, you know, you can get a nice high end DW or Tama kit for 1200. And then you kind of got to think to yourself, though, like, OK, it's plastic. It's not really a DW like collector series or whatever. You There's sort of that like, yes, it is what it is. I mean, and that raises the question, which maybe you can shine some light on, like. Company to company, and I probably asked this in the acrylic episode, company to company, z Coast, Fibes to Vistalite. I know there's different manufacturing techniques and seamless and inside of the form and outside of the form. Is there any difference when you're really playing these drums um, because they're just, there's not wood, they're just plastic? I mean, difference between different brands, you mean? Yeah, like or? like the sound. Is, is, is z Coast going to sound different than Fibes, really? You know, to I don't think, I think the timbre and the overall you know, uh, sound is going to be pretty much very, very, very similar, you know, because you got a very hard reflective, you know, surface you're using, you have there, you know, unlike, you know, of course you got like those stainless steel drums that were just, you know, very, they're metal that again, they're very reflective too. You're going to be a little more canny sounding. They're kind of, I think more thinner sounding, yeah. but, um, they're very loud drums like the, you know, fives and fiberglass again, what do you have? They have a very hard surface, you know? Sure. Um, I think what really made a big difference in sound. I, I think Zico's with a thicker shell, and his bearing edges were a little bit, a little, made a little more contact with the drum head. weren't weren't quite as um, lively and ringy uh, as the uh, like Ludwig drums and stuff. And five, five is super loud too. Um, yeah. You know, and then later on when he came back you know, in the nineties and making his shells, he had like almost a round over bearing edge, and which made a lot of contact, a lot more contact with the head. And you could even put a single ply head on those drums then, and, and which is very uh, unusual because most everybody that had that played clear drums, when, when, when the two ply heads came out, everybody was, started, you know, was using those. You know, if, you, if you bought a new Vis like kit with silver dot heads on there, and you had the bottom clear heads on there, they were very loud. You know, it was a 40 mm-hmm. they had the muffled bass drum heads and things like that. So sound was just, you know, just crazy loud. So, but it wasn't, I don't think it was like a really big difference overall in, in between them. Sure. All. I don't think so. It's just very minimal. Of course, his again, Dico's had the two fly heads and they, 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 you could buy them with hydraulic heads too. So again, yeah. he was kind of, he kind of knew that, you know, that uh, he just slowed yeah. down the vibrations a little bit somehow. No, that's a good, good answer. And and I, I don't think we've officially said it yet, but just to kind of throw it out there for the, you know, the sake of history. And I know that it's hard to determine who did what first, because typically, like we said, things are going on with multiple places. And, and we may have said this earlier, but is it fair to say generally that Bill Zikos did invent the acrylic drums? I think so. Yeah, I really do. I think, I, I, I think he was the first one, you know, that uh, made a very, I guess you could say first home run or first hit out there in the marketplace. You know, they had him. I mean, you know, I'm sure other people was thinking about it. It's like how many people were thinking about, you know, going to the moon, maybe in different countries you know, back in the day. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm being kind of out there a little bit, but I'm just saying, though, I mean, I'm sure there's someone else thinking about it, but it's basically who really has a, a, the idea, you know, and, yeah. and, and gets it done. And he really did it. And he, he did it, I think, in a good way. I mean, you know, we came up with all the extra um, features of his drums. And as I mentioned earlier, too, some of his, lingo and you know some of the verbiage in his in his, in his uh pamphlets were kind of very forward thinking too hmm. you know he kind of says sir i'm, I'm gonna say one thing is don't mind me quoting this real quick single drums make a sound you haven't heard before they, they put together thunder at your fingertips soft the heartbeat whisper or slick stick smashing sound zico's sound is a rich explosive experience and he uses the word organic a couple of times too hmm. it's or this organic um unity and the sound it's part of the tonal concept you know and and he kind of says stuff like you know you can breathe on these zico's drums and you know it's just kind of an interesting you know way yeah you know, uh, really cool explained um the sound of the drums and everything which you know it's kind of kind of cool yeah kind of I mean, it's, hip it's, it's very hip it's very um uh progressive and you know we love that stuff as drummers. We like that. Like, you know, it kind of gets you amped up about your drums. It's not just like, um, you know, acrylic drums. Here's the sizes. Here's the whatever. It's it's more like, you know, 
just yeah. thunderous drums. It's it's just it's really good um, writing. Well, I think the thing about you know Bill Zico's uh, just knowing him myself. I mean, I know that with a lot of his students and everything, he was you know kind of had a, a very much a, a lot of times that it was a, a father figure. You know, he's kind of a mentor. Of course, he was a composer, inventor, and a great you know drummer as well. But um, the drum, he's a hip guy, you know, and I think he's, I think a lot of that came out is drums, you know, for that time, these were, this is a hip drum company, you know? Yeah. So, um, obviously you mentioned a little bit about the nineties and stuff. Um, I, I'm assuming that he had some fun doing it. It, it didn't exactly, it seems like it didn't blow up and become the next, like, you know, Pearl or something like that. But uh, what happened with that stuff? And then maybe take us through to the, the end of his, um, his life. Cause he's, he's obviously, he's no longer with us. Correct. Right. Yeah, he passed away actually in 2020, uh, that's a year ago in January, I think it was like wow. January 31st. And he lived to be like, no, I think he was 90 years old when he passed mm -hmm. away. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he actually bought back a lot of the, the Zico's company, uh, the whole drum company was in storage, uh, at the the drum shop there in Fort Wayne, um, and I guess he used to buy a lot of stuff from maybe some like the throw offs, maybe parts from from them or something. But I can't remember exactly how it got there, but supposedly it was in storage here, and they had to, to they moved it to there because uh, it's cause it maybe probably cheaper. And um, actually, I, I got a phone call from this is the guy the, the again the investor that that owned. Uh, 51% of the company. He called me one day. It's like around 1991, I If I had room for but 10 pallets, I said, no, right. I said, no, I really do not. But, you know, but somehow he made it around and made his way to, to Bill. And Bill actually bought the, the company, all the remains of it back. And that's how they, they kind of planted the seed for the next, you know, generation mm -hmm. or kind of making the, I guess, a uh, full trip around, you know, 360, you know. Yeah. You know, uh, back to full where circle. he was at. Yeah, made a full circle back, and so he, he but he didn't. Make, you know, he used the, some of the lugs. But he, he started bending his own lugs with uh, out of aluminum and everything, and a can make and everything. They're a little bit the drums he came out with then, the uh, stealth drums. Uh, what he what he called them, the lugs, and some of the hardware was kind of spacey looking again. Um, and he was making them down. This, this that we call it the old Coke building downtown for a while. And he was doing everything by hand. He was you know, really working uh, pretty hard. He had, a, he had the oven down there as well, the regular, the, the big oven that they, you know, they heated the acrylics up with. He had that and the molds. He was going fully, full into it. And then he brought his son into it, uh, help him out. He lives in uh, Canada. And he was a big, played a big part into helping him out, you know, make him everything. But I think by the early 2000s, like around 2003 or so, uh, he, was just ready about ready to retire. I think it was just, you know, wasn't really, uh, ready to, you know, kind of go with the ups and downs of the music industry, which again, there's a lot more newer trends were coming in and, um, inside to kind of call it quits. So I think there, he might've made a few more drums. I think, I think maybe ascended, you know, um, mm. up in, uh, like I said, up in Canada and, uh, they finally, he didn't want it. So I guess supposedly he did not want the drum cut to be to be sold to anybody else and and harming the reputation of the drums or anything like that. So they, I think I, well, I heard he destroyed the molds and everything. Why well, heard? Oh boy! I took, took him to the scrapyard. So it's dramatic. <laughs> it is kind of dramatic. I didn't know that till the other day. I, I, I heard that. So <laughs> yeah. So I guess that the story is, took a three sixty. Then it pretty much you know. Kind of put a uh, sharp end to things there, but yeah, uh, if he can't have it, no one can. <laughs> it's try it. destroyed now. I heard the same thing was happening with, with tricks on drums too, but I don't know. I heard um, that too, and someone told me it's not. I, folk, I mean, is a folkloric I, probably stuff. I, I don't know. I've been working on doing a tricks and episode for a long time, and I keep getting dead ends because people will say I can't do it. You need to go to. Um, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, but Ing Ingo, I believe, in in Germany, but he he's not super confident in his. English and um I haven't talked to him about in about a year and a half or a year but people don't want to do it because they say he's the man but I think I mentioned that at one point where 
Oh, I read that like the founder of Trixon got buried with all of his drums or something, or he destroyed them all. And someone told yeah. me, no, that's not true, but I, I can't confirm or deny, but I can just continue to spread that rumor. Um, <laughs> yeah. The there's a lot of folkloric stuff happens in the music business, you know, but yeah. And of course other businesses for industries as well. Yeah. I heard that he didn't, he was kind of mad because, uh, I think I heard like in the late nineties before he passed away, I guess he, he didn't want to be able to, you know, make his drums or anything anymore. And, uh, since it wasn't the biggest success, I guess he, um, supposedly had a bulldozer dig a, dig a big hole in the ground. Yeah. He, he threw everything in there. That's what, you know, I've heard, but you know, yeah. You know, Who knows? Not to go off on a tangent here though. I, I heard that Ringo actually wanted to play a tricks on kit before he really? was Ludwig. Yeah. And he went to that. I think it was Arbiter was the big distributor over there in, in Great Britain. And yeah. he, he just got Ludwig a few weeks before that. And, and I think, I think he did see some in the window. Ringo was, you know, familiar with Ludwig too as well. He really liked him, but I heard her for a second that he was thinking about playing tricks on. So he still got hip to, so you know, more hip to Ludwig and stuff, but kind of interesting how that, been, how, 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 how that would have changed the whole drumming world in the history of, uh, the Beatles yeah. and everything, you know, to a certain extent, it'd been interesting what would happen with that. But yeah, man, the world would be totally different. Yeah. All the tricks on drums that'd be out there right now. It'd be, it'd be kind of interesting, you know? Yeah. But it didn't work out that way. I'm sure tricks on would have been extremely happy. And I know, you know, obviously buddy played it briefly. Um, but that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's when they had the Vox name on there. Yeah, Remember Vox, that? exactly. Yeah. They licensed the Vox name on there for a while. It was kind of interesting. It's all pretty good. I mean, it's all good that he he, he chose Ludwig. That's a good yeah. choice, I think. It, it worked out. Yeah. Well, Wes, um, why don't you tell people as we finish up here, um, you know, I'm sure you do online sales and all that stuff. So why don't you talk about your shop a little bit and then we'll uh, kind of wrap up here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we've been in business now, I guess, you know, 30, 37 years, and we're a full line percussion shop. Uh, of course, we sell drum sets, cymbals, cymbal stands, all the you know, hardware uh, for drums, but we also sell a lot of uh, hand percussion, ethnic percussion from all over the world. We sell electronic drums, and we're really into cymbals, snare drums, and, and things like that, which are part of our, you know, specialty as well. We got we have a lot of that stuff in stock and, and a very good selection. And everybody that works with us is very passionate about drums, and we we love music and uh, love drumming. So it's ever yeah. always a good reason to go to your drum shop. You know, and we appreciate everybody that's done business with us before. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you for letting me uh, mention that. Oh yeah, for sure. And it's explores percussion so it's X- and drums. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's X P L O R E S. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Percussion yeah. and drums. What's the What's your website? It's uh, actually that's explorersdrums.com website. Okay. Yeah, and you can type explorersprocussion.com too. That'll work as well. Explorersdrums.com. Awesome. Yeah, and you're you know you're a dude who owns a drum shop in 2021, who I'm sure has been through some tough times over the last year. Um, but you know you made it through, and um, yeah, it's been interesting times, you know for sure for everybody as well. But yeah, it's been. You know, I think some of our online sales. Has, has definitely helped us out. We've been we're pretty diversified shop. We deal a little bit with schools, and we also do uh, repairs, you know, and recovering and restoration of drums as well. And uh, that's definitely helped us out to be diversified like that. You know, yeah, so, I'm sure. And we do lessons as well too. Of course, the lessons during the uh, pandemic was not very good at all. It's very strange. In fact, we had no lessons going on for a while at yeah. all there because all the teachers just had to do it online because you know. Everybody was quarantined, yeah. you know, for almost 14 months. But yeah. by the first of the year, we started kind of getting back into it. It's kind of about half and half. Because a lot of parents that or people have like the younger players, they didn't, I don't think they didn't want to put their child in a room with the drummer and it's all never human you know, that close yeah. up. And no. so, and we still exercise mask a little bit right now if, if sure. the customer has a mask and all that good stuff. So, yeah. Cool. Well, um, then I want to also give a shout out to Mr. Andrew Moore, uh, who suggested this episode and got me in touch with Wes, uh, who Wes told me is a great drummer, but he's also a great dentist, which uh, is yes. those are two, two good things. 
Yeah, Andrew's really, you know, he's, he's, he really is great dentist and great staff. Actually, what I'd, I'd like to say something about his father, man. His father would taught, I think, dentistry for like 50 years or so at the UMKC, the University of Missouri here in town, which is that's the longest teaching career I think I've ever heard from anybody. Yeah, 50 years. Yeah, that's 50 years teaching. It's pretty, it's a big dental school here that's down here at the University of Missouri, but that's kind of unique. But yeah, Andrew, yeah. Andrew's great guy, and I thank him for mentioning me mentioned this to you and it's been a great pleasure for you and you know give me the yeah. opportunity to do this especially you know talking about i think uh subject you know zico's drones which definitely deserves to be you know talk about it and, and for sure absolutely and uh it's i mean literally we we first talked in august of 2020 and now it's june of 2021 so <laughs> like i always say these take a long time to just kind of like things fall off and then they go on but um and uh, congrats, your daughter's getting married soon, so that's extremely cool. Um, yep. I'm sure. Next week is an exciting, very exciting yeah. week. Just Take stay out of the way. Me. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> very crazy right now at times. Cool. Well, um, on that note, Wes, this has been amazing and one that's been on my list for a long time. So I appreciate you um, taking the time to share with me. Thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.